We've been talking about the end times, and um, so I've got one more lesson. Uh, er every week I, I think, well, that's probably the last lesson in that series, but then uh, I find another lesson. So uh, I'm going to have, have an, at least one more lesson here today, Lord willing. But uh, we've been looking at the end times from a, a, certain, ki a certain perspective. What is that perspective? What, how, uh, what, is, what is the focus of our end times? What has the focus of our end times lessons been? Anybody remember? What's the, the outlook? Of course, a lot of you haven't been here for some of these lessons because you're uh, just returning back to us from being gone for a while. So. Is it the chronology? It's not the chronology, no. Is it the uh, fulfillment of prophecy? No, no, no. Our focus has been, we know the end times are coming, so what should we do about it? That's been our focus on all of these lessons. And I, looking at this, this is our 18th lesson on this, okay? So we've seen a lot about what we should be doing about the end times. And the fact that we know the end times are coming, we know we are in the end times, and, and the end is approaching. You know, it, it's not really an end, though, is it? It's more of a beginning. It's more of a, a new beginning, a great and glorious beginning. But uh, for this world, it's going to be the end. And so we know these times are coming. And so what should we be doing about it? What, should, what is the appropriate response? And so we've been looking at that. Um, I do want to share something with you and, and, and ask your forgiveness right off the bat. Um, I, I got an invitation to go down to Chitna. You, you know this mural in the baptistry is, is literally taken from a photograph of the Copper River. I, I got to go one time past uh, Haley Creek and we drove for probably an hour on the four-wheeler. So we probably went 10, 15 miles south of Haley Creek. And I got up on, a, on, a, on a, an embankment, and there's this picture right here. And I spoke to the lady that painted it one time, and I said, is that of the Copper River? And she said, yeah, we used to live in Chitna. And I took a photograph, and I said, I know the exact spot where you took that photograph, because I got on a rock, and, and there it was, this exact picture right here. So, uh, so I got an invitation to go down to Chitna Friday night and ride on a boat and do our dip netting on a boat. So we left Friday night, drove all Friday night, got there at 1 o'clock in the morning, got in the boat, went down the canyon, fished till, what time did we fish to, Joyka? Yeah, so we fished, yeah, we got in the boat at midnight, fished till 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon, then drove back last night. So I haven't slept since, except for uh, just a couple hours uh, last night. So it, I'm not going to. I said I'm not going to ad lib, and here I am ad libbing. Because who knows? You know, the filter's broken today between the brain and the mouth. So <laughs> I'm going to try to stick to my notes, okay? Uh, but at any rate, so please forgive me if I if I get my words mixed up here. But uh, we've been looking at the end times, so, and I also thought about this picture. You know, if now that everybody knows it's about Chitna, if I want to distract everybody in the whole auditorium, all I have to say is, oh, hey, I heard the fish are running. Everybody looks at the picture, right? Oh, the fish are running. And, I, and my brain got this picture of everybody jumping out and leaving the auditorium all of a sudden. <laughs> but at any rate, like I said, the filter's kind of broken today. Um, so we've been looking at the end times. And what should our response be to the end times? Okay, so those of you that have been here, can you remember any of the uh, uh, of the instructions that we've received from the Word of God, uh, specifically even what Jesus told his disciples when they asked him the question in Matthew chapter 24, what is the sign of, and he explained the destruction of the temple, what, when shall these things be, when would the temple be destroyed, and what will be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? That was what the disciples asked Jesus Christ. What's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the world. And so this is uh, and then what followed in Matthew 25, uh, 24 and 25. It was Jesus' instruction about the destruction of the temple, which occurred in 70 AD, and uh, the things that would be leading up to. And in that instruction, uh, leading up to the, 
the end of the world. And the thing, uh, one, some of the things in Jesus' instructions were specific commands for us. Do you remember what some of those commands were? And then we've looked at other texts as well. So any of those that come to mind, what should we be doing? Watch and be ready. Yeah, the Lord said, watch. Be, be watching, be aware. Hey, this world's going to come to an end. You know, not just be oblivious. Does uh, you remember any of the examples in history, in biblical history, about people... The end was coming, and they were oblivious. They were marrying and giving in marriage and eating and drinking until the end came. What people does that describe? Noah, in the days of Noah, yeah. We don't want to be like that, right? We don't want to be like the world before it was overcome with a flood. We want to be like Noah, saying, hey, folks, wake up. The end is coming here. This, this, this world is going to end. So we want to watch and we want to be ready. Do you remember any of the other uh, instructions about what we should be doing? A doer. A doer, yeah. We need to be doing. We need to be busy. Oh, in endure. Okay, sorry. I thought you said a doer. No, that's all right. My wife does that all the time, too. She mumbles, so don't, don't feel bad. It's not just you. <laughs> so, sorry, I, I told you the filter's broken today. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're not going to. Nobody's going to volunteer an answer from here on out. Yeah, okay. We should endure, yes. Be patient. Be patient, and that has to do with enduring, right? Being patient in the Bible uh, refers to enduring afflictions. We know afflictions are going to increase more and more on God's people, and so we need to be patient and have that enduring quality, uh, that, that enduring attitude, if you will, being able to persevere through, through the afflictions. You, all right, folks, I, I won't pick on anybody else, I promise. Does anybody remember any other ones? Right, be prepared. That's uh, in the category of being ready, and that was indeed one of the the parables that the Lord gave uh, as He was describing that in Matthew twenty four and twenty five. Uh, being being prepared, be ready. Yeah. Uh, what is the biggest thing we need to do? Anyone needs to do to be ready for the Lord's return. What's that? Be saved. Be saved. Yeah, that's step number one. Yeah, be saved. Be saved, indeed. Any other things you remember about uh, what, should, what we should do to, to be ready? Or if you don't remember or not, and want to, but you can think of something. So uh, we, we talked about uh, being busy, right? We need to be busy as well. Uh, another parable that the Lord gave was uh, of the, the one who... The Lord left and gave to his servants uh, talents, right? Uh, to, to one he gave, what, ten talents? To another he gave two, another word he gave just one. And so there's going to be an accountability for us uh, based on what we've done with what the Lord's given us, right? And he's given us the gospel, given us salvation, he's given us a relationship with him, he's given us the knowledge that the end is coming, uh, and so what do we do with that? And we're going, we're going to have to stand before the Lord and give an account for what we've done with what the Lord's given us. And so we need to be busy. We looked at Second Peter, and we saw that we need to be growing. So in other words, we don't say, well, the end's coming. I'm just going to hide in a corner and, uh, and, and, and wait until the end comes. But we need to be growing. And one of the areas we looked in, in Second First uh, Thessalonians, and that is we need to be growing in our sanctification, growing in our separation from the world and separated unto Christ and His work. So we need to be growing as well. And so we're we're proactive, even though the end is coming. We're not stepping back. We're not to be hiding. We're not to be just kind of hanging out and waiting, as in in the idea of just you know, holding our hands and waiting. Our idea of waiting is that of a waiter 
who says what, you know, in service and serving. Uh, so we, we're, we are to be growing and being busy and learning more and more about the Lord, learning more about his will for us, now, learning how to use those talents that he's given to us and putting them, exercising our faith, putting them into action. And uh, we need to be diligent. In, in uh, particular, be diligent that we be found without spot and be found blameless. We need to be diligent. And that's connected to our sanctification as well. We need to be diligent about that. In other words, always in our minds, that we are to be sanctified unto the Lord and not slack in any, any regard to our service to the Lord, but diligent in that. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the fact that we need to continue in the things that we have learned. So we've been given a great spiritual heritage, and we need to, to continue in that. And then last week in particular, I looked at we need to encourage and promote and to participate in the preaching of the word. And we all have a role to play in that. We all have a, a responsibility in the preaching of the word. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. And of course, the, the preacher and the pastor, the missionary, uh, that's, a, that's a direct charge to preach the word, but we all have a responsibility in that. And can you remember any of the aspects in which we are, we have a part in the preaching of the word, that everybody has a part in the preaching of the word. What can we do about that? Anybody remember? What are you doing right now? You're assembling together, yeah. Our, our big part in that is we get together. And we listen to the preaching of the word. We encourage it. We promote it by being here. I can't tell you. Uh, I, I, I think I mentioned last week, too, when it was when we didn't have services here, and I sat in the back room, and I had my little studio set up with lighting and all of that kind of stuff, and I was preaching to the computer. I don't like preaching to a computer. That's, that's no fun at all. I, I, just, I do not like that. I knew you were on the other side, and that was the only motivator behind it, you know, just the, the abstract thought that, you know, somewhere in this little box is all the people that are listening to me. But at any rate, um, that's not the same as you being here. And so we encourage the promote, and we promote the preaching of the word by, by sitting under the preaching of the word, but then most importantly, by receiving the preaching of the word, that we would do it, right? So we are to continue in doing that until the Lord comes. We are to, we are to promote that preaching of the word. We are, we are to promote it through the uh, sending forth of missionaries, through the, um, you know, just the encouragement of the importance of the preaching of the word and preachers and raising up uh, preachers and, and training them and being diligent and, and responsible and how... Uh, you know, the qualifications of preachers, that, that has really gone lax here in recent times, the qualifications of pastors in particular, I should, I should say qualifications of pastors, that's, that's very important. And, uh, but we need to maintain that importance. We need to not let that slip. And so we encourage the preaching of the word. And so, so I, 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 I was fearful that this might happen because of lack of sleep. I'm going to ramble a lot, so don't let me ramble, okay? Say, brother, stick to the point, okay? So we're going to get to the point. Um, we're going to look today at, kind of take a backwards look at what we need to be doing for preparing for the end. So we're going to look today at a period of time when the people of Israel, or at least some people in Israel, were greatly anticipating the Messiah, okay? They knew that there was going to be a Messiah. They didn't know when. They had some idea of what he was going to be like and what he was going to do, um, but he hadn't arrived yet. And so we're going to look at, at two people, Simeon and Anna. You'll be familiar with this story. So let's go to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. 
And we're going to find out these two people were anticipating the arrival of a Messiah. They were waiting. They were, they were doing the things that we're commanded to do today. Okay, that's really where I'm going with this. These, these are examples that we can look back to in time and see that, you know, in, a, in some ways they're just like us. They were anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, only this would be his, his coming to this earth for, for, to die on the cross, whereas we're looking for his coming to this earth to rule and to reign and to set all things in order, first to gather us up and then to come back and rule and to reign. But nevertheless, it, it, at least there's a similarity in that they were looking for and anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, and so are we today. So they were doing some of these things that we've been instructed to do as well. And so I just think it's, there's, there's some uh, usefulness in taking a, a quick look back. At, and it, this isn't very in-depth, but at least it gives us an idea and lets, lets us know we're not the only ones that have been looking for the Messiah. And if we stop and think about it, all Christians have been looking for the Messiah since the Lord ascended into heaven and the angel said in like manner he shall return. And so all Christians have been anticipating his return. But this Anna and Simeon were anticipating the arrival of the Jewish Messiah. And so let's uh, look here in Luke chapter 2 and we'll begin reading in verse 22. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, this was talking about Mary, they brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. And this is what I mean by, you know, he was anticipating. This word consolation carries with it, in fact, in other places it's translated in the Bible, comfort. It's a comfort. He was waiting for the comfort of Israel. He was waiting for all the things that the Bible had said about the Messiah and what he would do for Israel. Simeon was anticipating this, and he was busy about his work in the, with the attitude, constant, present attitude, the Messiah's coming. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Well, there's a good indication for us. If we're going to be waiting for the return of the Lord, um, if we're going to do these things that were instructed in the Bible that we should be doing in the end times, I know my grammar and that was all mixed up, but um, if we're if we're going to be diligent and faithful in in being way, uh, ready and watching and growing and and being prepared and uh, encouraging the preaching of the word and not to um, uh, sway from the word of God, but rather to continue in the things that we've learned, if we're going to be faithful in that, I think we can say that the Holy Spirit is going to bless that in us. And we see in Simeon that he was waiting for the consolation of the uh, Lord and a consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was with him. This is, we need this. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit each and every hour as we go th through our walk in these end times. And in verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit unto the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the customs of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. 
Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phenuel, of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. How old was this, was this woman? 84, a great age. Four score and four years. That's 84. She was of great age. Did she give up? She was still serving the Lord, wasn't she? You know, we are to serve the Lord until the Lord says, come on home. We, we don't give up. We just keep serving the Lord. And this is what she was doing. And, and verse 38, And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So not only was Anna the prophetess serving the Lord and was uh, evidently in, in anticipation of the Savior, but she spoke also to other people that were like her and like Simeon that were looking for redemption in Israel. They're looking to see Jerusalem redeemed. Okay, In other words, Jerusalem was under Roman rule at that time. They were anticipating that they would be freed from that, that, they, that the Messiah would come and pay the price, if you will, and, and do what was necessary for Jerusalem to be redeemed back unto God and out from underneath the burden of Roman rulership. In verse 39, And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. So here we see with Simeon. Now, a lot of times, um, Simeon is depicted and and described as an ancient man. We don't know that. It doesn't say. And I think Brother Paul brought out this in his Harmony of the Gospels. that We don't know whether Simeon was an old man or not. We know that he said, don't let me see death until I... Uh, uh, it was revealed to him that he would not see death until he saw the Lord. And so we surmise that maybe he was old, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he was. But at any rate... Uh, Simeon was wait, one waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Israel. He was waiting. He was in anticipation. He was aware that it could be any time. And Anna uh, was, um, she gave thanks unto the Lord when she saw Jesus Christ, giving thanks for what the Lord had brought forth to Israel. And uh, she was among others who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And so this tells me that there was, as Simeon and Anna were just two examples of many people in Jerusalem and in Israel that were anticipating the Messiah at that time. They were, they were aware of the fact that he should come, and they were, they were looking forward to this and waiting. They were waiting for that time. So kind of like us, right? We're, we're waiting for the return of the Lord. We're, we know that he's going to come. So what I want to do, and I'm going to spend a little time this morning, and we're going to read through some of the prophecies, just a small portion of the prophecies related to the Messiah. So these are the things that Anna and Simeon and people like them would have in their minds as promises that the Messiah should come. These, this is what they were waiting on. This is what informed them that they should be expecting a Messiah, the Messiah of the Lord, to come to, to, the, to this earth and redeem Jerusalem. So we're going to go through these prophecies, and, and I may ask for volunteers to read. I'll read some of them. But as we go, I want you to kind of do your homework, get a pencil and paper if you need to, and, and, and just kind of make note or make mental note of what it was that they were looking for, okay? What, what, what sort of things would, would they be expecting in a Messiah as to the timing of his arrival, 
what he was going to do when he, when he came, what, uh, what was going to happen to this earth when the Messiah should come, okay? So what was it that, that Simeon and Anna and people like them were anticipating? What, is, what was on their minds? What, um, you know, we have certain things on our minds through the New Testament and the Old Testament of prophecy that informs us and gives us certain expectations of what Jesus Christ is going to do when he returns. And I gave you three charts. Remember those charts that uh, uh, I, I wrote up one of them that kind of mapped out the end times chronologically and puts the various Bible prophecies. I think I had one on there from another organization called the Bible Project or something like that, and they had their arrangement of their interpretation of the end times. And then I had one from uh, Charles Thomas from years ago, uh, pastor, he was the pastor of Rogers Baptist Church. Uh, and he had his arrangement. And, and if you remember, I told you that any, any pastor or preacher that's ever made one of those charts about the end times and their interpretation of how all that goes together, I think they, when they're buried, if they die before the Lord returns, they ought to have that their chart rolled up and in their hands as they're in their coffin with the bottle of whiteout and a pencil. And so that when they get to heaven, they can say, oh, I got that one wrong. And so they, got, you know, they can cross it out and write in how it really is, right? And so that way they get their chart just perfect when they get to heaven, right? That, that's my interpretation of what we all ought to do with our charts here. But uh, at any rate, we've got these expectations, don't we? We, we kind of have it in our mind what Jesus Christ is going to do going to do when he returns. I want you to, as we go through these passages, I want you to kind of formulate or, 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 or imagine, if you will, or get a picture of what was in their minds. What were they anticipating? What did their chart look like, okay, if they, if they actually wrote out a chart, you know, of how all of this was going to exactly map out. And uh, so what, what sort of things might have even um, prejudiced prejudiced their reception of Jesus Christ because we know that for a lot of people when they saw Jesus they came to him anticipating everybody says this is the Messiah this is him you know he got, he's got all these disciples going around saying this is him but then all of a sudden he didn't meet their expectations and they turned away from him they rejected him many people even when they heard his teachings at one point were offended at him and followed him no more. And it says before that that they believed. They believed he was, with, he was the Messiah, but then the, when they heard what he had to say, well, this didn't match their expectations, and they turned around and left, never to follow him again. So as we go through these prophecies, Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, and what, may, what informed Anna and Simeon and those like them, put, draw out from that the things that they would be expecting, okay? And kind of compare that to where we're at today, what we are expecting that Jesus Christ is going to do when he returns again. So let's look, look at what they were looking for. Let's start, first of all, with Genesis 3.15, and I'll read that. And who'd like to read Genesis 12.3? Genesis 12.3. Okay, Brother John. And then who'd like to read Genesis 49 and verse 10? Okay, Alex. And then who'd like to read Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15? Deuteronomy 18.15. All right, thank you, Brother Ray. Appreciate that. I saw you move your hand, although you were licking your finger to turn the page. But this is kind of like an auction. I mean, you, you twitch your nose, and I'll say, gone. You got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you, I've got you now to where you won't say anything, you won't move, you won't blink your eyes. Right? <laughs> All right, who'd like to read Psalm 132 and verse 11? All right, Brother Dawson, thank you. And then Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Isaiah 7, 14. Okay, Alex? And uh, we'll stop with this one here. Isaiah 9 and verse 2. Isaiah 9, 2. 
Okay, Joyka, thank you. All right, Genesis 3.15. We have the first prophecy in the Bible, explicitly uh, at least, uh, about the coming of a Messiah. And this is as the Lord is speaking to, to Eve in the garden after the fall. And the Lord says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He's talking to the serpent at this point, excuse me. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so this is a reference to the victory of the Messiah over Satan, over sin, but this is a definitely a prophecy related to the Messiah, okay? Given to both the serpent and to Eve uh, as, as her seed. And so in other words, this is the, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who uh, came to this earth as God incarnate. Uh, for us. And this is a prophecy related to that. So this is something that would have informed Anna and Simeon, waiting for one that would have victory over Satan. Uh, how about Genesis 12, 3? All right, so this is a, prom, a pro, promise and prophecy to Abraham. And so this is of the seed of Abraham, which at this point he had had no children, uh, and he was old in age, but he's promised that uh, he and Sarah would have a child that would be blessed of God, and all the families of the earth would be blessed through this child. And so this is the anointed one, the Messiah. <clears throat> so this is another thing that would have informed Anna and Simeon and the people that were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem and the consolation of Israel. Uh, Genesis 49 and verse 10. All right. So the scepter, this has to do with dominion, and the king is the one who holds the scepter, right? So the uh, scepter shall not depart uh, from Judah, so we know something about this, that uh, a king is going to come. He's going to be of the tribe of Judah. So it's another thing that people would be looking for, right? And, uh, and to him shall the gathering of the people be. He's going to bring Israel back together. And so he's going to bring Israel together. He's going to be a unifier for Israel and a lawgiver and a king, and he's going to rule, Okay. And we know that he's going to be a blessing to all of the earth through the prophecy that was given to uh, Abraham. Uh, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. Who had that one? Yeah, De Deuteronomy 18, 15. Right, so he will be uh, a prophet raised up from the midst of them. So he's going to come from Israel, uh, and he'll be. Uh, Moses was speaking about this. Um, uh, he will be like unto me. What did Moses do? He delivered Israel. So he's going to be a deliverer, right? Moses led the people out of bondage of Egypt, and so Moses said, "Now this is." Has, this is kind of a duplex prophecy because it's talking about Joshua, but Joshua as a type of Christ leads us on into saying, well, this also applies to Jesus Christ. And so Anna and Simeon, in the days when Jesus came to this earth, uh, they would be looking for one that's going to be a king, a lawgiver, a ruler, a deliverer, a leader, a liberator, like Moses, and one that, that can uh, gather all a unifying force within Israel and a blessing to all the world. Uh, Psalm 132 and verse 11. All 
All right, so again here, he's going to sit on the throne. He's going to be a, a, a king for Israel of the lineage of Judah, uh, more particularly of the lineage of David. Uh, Isaiah 7 and verse 14. All right, he's going to be of virgin birth, right? Uh, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. And so we, we know this is going to be the God-man. And so that's also a specific prophecy. And so Anna and Simeon would have been looking for this too, a, a virgin birth. So when they saw Mary and understood the circumstances of the birth of Jesus Christ. This would have been a big sign for them. This would be something that they would see, okay, this has been fulfilled, and they would recognize Jesus in that. Uh, Isaiah 9, 2. All right, so... He's going to be a light. And in fact, Jesus Christ made mention of this when he was in Galilee. Uh, the, the people that walked in darkness had seen a great light, a land of shadow of death. So this is, this is even, uh, many of these things are the same thing we're looking for, right? And the, they still apply to Jesus Christ and how he's going to, when he returns and things he's going to do. To have the scepter and the, and the lawgiver, and he's king, he's going to redeem Israel, he's going to gather them together, be a blessing to the rest of the earth. Isaiah chapter 8, in verses 13 through 15, we, we have another prophecy here. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary. But, a, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, and for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. So he's going to be an offense to many of the house of Israel. So yes, Israel is looking for this, and Anna and Simeon were looking for their redemption, their redeemer. But we also know that there's going to be many people that are, that are going to be offended at this. They're going to be, they're not, Jesus Christ is not going to live up to their expectations. And so they will reject him. <clears throat> and that's true today even. <clears throat> uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10 says, <clears throat> and, in, <clears throat> excuse me, and in that day there should be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So not only is the, uh, and was the coming of Jesus Christ the first time uh, a promise for Israel, it was a promise for the Gentiles as well. It was something that would be a blessing to the, uh, to the Gentiles, even as Abraham was told that he would be... Um, all the families of the earth would be blessed. In Isaiah 25 and verse 8, he will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now Israel was under the leadership, under the dominion of the Roman Empire at that time. They had been under the Babylonians, they had been under the Assyrians, and so we see at this point that um, they had been under the Greeks as well. So we see that in this prophecy that the rebuke of Israel would be wiped away from off the earth. In other words, from being a dominated people, that rebuke would be wiped away. They'd be exalted through their Messiah. He would be one to exalt them. And... <clears throat> Death would be swallowed up in victory. There's the promise of uh, eternal life here as well. In Isaiah 49 and verse 6, And he said, 
It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I also will give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation to the end of the earth. So the Messiah is going to be a light to the Gentiles as well. Again, another prophecy related to the Messiah being for all the earth. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah 61. Let's go to Isaiah 61 and we'll read verses 1 through 9. I made mention of this, I believe, in... No, th this is... Uh, one that uh, Simeon makes mention to or alludes to in his prophecy when he, when he met Jesus Christ here. But Isaiah 61 and verses 1 through 9. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives. And that's where the Lord ended when he read this in the synagogue, right? He stopped right there. But it, the prophecy goes on. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of avenge, vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion and to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your uh, plowmen and your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of, the, of the, our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame shall ye have double. For your confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among all people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. Wow, that's some really rich promises for the people of Israel. The Gentiles are going to come in here and they're going to serve you. You're going to have dominion over them. All the earth is going to acknowledge you as being the blessed people of God. All of the Gentiles are going to uh, give glory to God. And, and, and all for your shame, you're going to have double. All of the troubles you've been through, just think about Israel. The troubles that nation has been through, and even in recent times, the Holocaust. And yet the Lord is going to double their portion of goodness upon them in return for what they've had to go through as a nation. The blessings upon Israel are going to be amazing. And all the Gentiles are going to wow at what God's going to do with Israel. And so Simeon and Anna are sitting there in their day and age thinking, yeah, Lord, come on, we're ready for this. This is good. This is going to be great. Life's going to be good, uh, being under the Messiah and being under his leadership and, and having our kingdom restored. And, and we're going to be the center of the earth and, and the people of the earth. And all the nations are going to call us blessed because we're the people of God. And this is what they were looking forward to when, when they held up that baby and looked at Jesus Christ and recognized him as the Messiah. This is what they were anticipating. More to the timing of the coming of the Messiah, let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 and verses 24 and 25. They had some idea of when the Messiah would come. They had some idea, okay? I think they could have known the exact day when Jesus Christ walked into Jerusalem and 
body presenting him as the king, singing Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. But assuming my, my speculation is wrong, they would at least know the general time, okay? If not the very day, at least they would know the general time. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. This is Daniel 9, 24. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So this is the, the seven, Daniel 70-week prophecy. And that's a, you know the big picture that is given here. But now we get into the specifics in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, now we've got that recorded in Nehemiah and in Ezra, uh, somewhere around 445 or 455 B.C., depending on which one you take, from that time, Unto the Messiah of the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. So threescore and two is 62 plus seven is 69, okay? So we know there's 69 weeks and those are weeks of years. And so we can count out the years from the day that that commandment goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the city, as opposed to rebuilding the temple, but rebuilding Jerusalem you could count out 69 times 7 years until the Messiah. So, you know, the biblical scholars, they could count it up and say, you know, hey, we're, we're right at that time when we should be anticipating the Messiah. And I imagine there were a lot of people in those days that were going around saying, hey, you know, we're really close. The Messiah could be coming any time. And Simeon and Anna were of that group, class of people, that group of people. Isn't that kind of like us today? We can look at prophecy and say, hey, we're really close, world. We need to watch and be ready, get ready. And the first thing you need to do to get ready is to be saved. And we're warning and telling the world, hey, the time is here. And continuing here in verse 25, um, and the street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. And so uh, there's going to be this rebuilding of Jerusalem even in troublous times. We go on in, in, in Malachi, we read uh, in, uh, about the, the, the prophecy of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was already on the scene in those days, and uh, he wasn't preaching yet when Anna and Simeon met him, but he, he would be shortly thereafter. So all those that were waiting for the consolation of Israel and the redemption of Jerusalem, when they heard John the Baptist out in the wilderness preaching, Whoa, this is an answer to prophecy, or this could be. Let's go, let's go check it out. And so flocks of people came from all over Israel, came down from Jerusalem, and went out to see and hear John the Baptist. So all of this is going on and letting the people know, hey, things are happening. The Messiah is coming, if not here already. He's going to be here. There was this great anticipation that God was going to send his Messiah. And Anna and Simeon were looking and waiting, and that there were others as well. And we see some of these characteristics that they and, and the apostles too, the disciples that believed Jesus is the Messiah, they trusted that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. Uh, but yet they didn't know the timing, and we see that indicated by this Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3 when the disciples asked what is what will be the signs of thy coming and the end of the world and, and, and when's, when's the destruction of the temple going to be they didn't know the timing of it but they knew that he's the one and that these things have to take place and even as I made mention all the throngs of people that took Jesus Christ before he was crucified and, and cried out, Hosanna, and they laid down the palm leaves and their clothes, and he rode in on the foal of an ass, and he came into Jerusalem as a king would, and uh, they pronounced him, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. They were really presenting him as the king, expecting his triumphant entry into Jerusalem 
victory over the dominion and rule over the city, and he would claim it, and by the power of God, he would rule the earth. They were disappointed when he got hung on a cross. I mean, they were disappointed, and they ended up putting him on the cross. He didn't meet their expectations. And that goes to, that's true today, too. What we read about Jesus Christ doesn't meet what's in people's minds and what they think Jesus Christ ought to be. They don't receive him as the one that was crucified for their sin. They're looking at the material benefits. They're looking at, you know, what can God do for me as far as uh, name it and claim it type things. We have to come to grips with who Christ is. First of all, based on our necessity for a Savior. And that he is that savior for us. And that he came and he died and he rose again and now he's coming again. And many of the things that Anna and Simeon were looking for have yet to be fulfilled. But we're going to get to see it fulfilled when Christ comes again. Did anyone in those days have a clear understanding of the timing of all the prophecies and the things that they were anticipating? No, they didn't. And it's pretty evident by the way they behaved and the questions they asked, the way they reacted at times. They, they didn't really fully understand the timing. They had an idea. I mean, think of the, the wise men that came from the east that, that met with Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Uh, they saw the star in heaven, and they knew this was an indication that, that, that the king of the Jews had been born and the, the one that would be a blessing to all the world that would have world rule, they knew that this was his sign, and so they reacted to it. They came in anticipating, uh, and they brought gifts. And so we know these things are coming. I think the, the wise men probably had a clearer understanding of the timing of things uh, than, than a lot of people did because they were watching the heavens based on a prophecy in Daniel that they should anticipate a star. And they were looking at the stars. That was something that they did. And so we know that nobody really knows the exact timing of the Lord's return. And we know that many people like us gathered together here today are anticipating the Lord's return. And we've got it all charted out and mapped on the sequence of events and everything that's going to take place prior to the Lord's return, during his return. Um, and I'll just close with this. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we actually get to see all of this unfold? When all of the Old Testament saints, those that have been saved since the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, the New Testament saints, when all of us see it, it's going to be shocking. It's going to be amazing. We're going to see it all come together. And yes, some of our expectations may be a little off because we're looking through a cloud darkly right now. But when that day comes, when the word of God is completely fulfilled and we see it happen before our eyes, we'll see everything so true, so clear, and we'll be bringing glory to God. In the meantime, we need to be like Anna and Simeon. And what we see, they saw that little infant and in him, their faith, let them realize this is the one. This is the Savior. We need to see Jesus Christ as God has presented him to us in his word. And as the Holy Spirit convicts us in our own hearts of our own sin and our need for a Savior. And we see him pre presented to us in the Bible. We need to see him for as he's presented to us at that moment, in this moment in time. And accept all that God has said about what he will do and how all that's going to come together. And be ready and waiting and diligent and patient and working and busy and growing and encouraging the preaching of the word. All of these things we need to be doing until the Lord comes. And we know that it will all be fulfilled perfectly when he does. So I hope this is just kind of in hindsight looking at Anna and Simeon and these others encouraged us to take what the Lord's given to us and act upon it, knowing 
that the mysteries of God are going to be fulfilled in a, in a great and marvelous way, and it's going to be glorious to see it when it does. We go forward in faith, knowing that it will. All right, we'll close with that. Let's, uh, let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. I went over time just a little bit, and so the kids are probably ready to get up here.